Okay, so I'd now like to invite Mara Bunn of the Australian um, Ethical, our platinum sponsor, to come and say a few words. Mara's been a non-executive director of the Australian Ethical Investment since 2013. She wears many hats, as we all do. Uh, she's also president of the Australian Conservation Foundation, chairman of the Gold, uh, Gold Coast Waterways Authority, and non-executive director of Innova Community Energy. Please uh, join me in warmly welcoming Mara to the stage. So, um, can I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging? Can I thank you, incredible people? <laughs> it feels like we're at this nexus in uh, not just human evolution, but the planet itself and its capacity to sustain life. And uh, those of you who dedicate your lives and careers and insights towards the greater good uh, really inspire those of us that support you. So thank you very much. This is a very funny situation. I'm here representing the sponsor of this event, Australian Ethical. I was supposed to talk for five, 10 minutes, but of course I could talk forever, so I'll try to not wax too lyrical. Um, this morning, I am from Sao Paulo, from Brazil, and this morning, uh, as, as I opened my phone, my family WhatsApp was just raging with what happens in, in Santiago. And I, I was, oh my goodness, que pasa in Chile, right? Because the last few days I've been focused on rivers and finance, and so I just Googled Chile, as we do. And the first article that came up was an Al Jazeera article. And it said the root cause of what now happens in Chile is inequality, is that people cannot su support a minor increase in the the, the cost of the tram, that there's a structural uh, dampening of what used to be the middle class and for working Chileans, it now is just impossible. So 15 people dead. And for those of us from Latin America who know the history, we now see the drivers of inequality. Um, Earlier this year, I had a really amazing opportunity, and I had a photo to share, but I think it's just too hard to get things into the back, so we won't bother, but I, I, I spend two days a week working for a cooperative research center that deals with the future of food using digital technologies. Uh, it's called Food Agility, hosted at UTS, many other universities. We found ourselves in Addis Ababa, supporting transformation of ILRI, which is the International Livestock Research Agency. And, and why the transformation? Because we have this marvelous research community with an architecture that goes back to World War II. And of course, they do very good work, but we have no time for very good work. We need impact now on the ground. So supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we led four workshops pulling together multiple stakeholders to become more agile and less planning, more experimentation, putting beneficiaries, smallholder farmers into the heart of research and development. And the photo I wanted to share was of this lovely uh, young woman, Magda, uh, who is 14 years old and lives about 45 minutes outside of Addis. And we did a big tour of smallholder poultry and dairy, and many others. And Magda, like 145 million children, 22% on the planet, suffers from stunting. And so it's just an amazing thing to go into these communities and realize just the impacts of lack of protein despite all of the progress, which is considerable. And earlier in the week, addressing the International Rivers Foundation, it was my you know, responsibility to share something that is just patently obvious, but we don't like talking about it. We, we like talking about two degrees and 1.5, because 1.5 is safer for our Pacific Island neighbors. But the grim reality is we are tracking towards four degrees. Emissions are rising, not falling. Our governments are becoming populist 
and looking towards a past that cannot be reproduced in the future. Now the consequence of that for rivers is every degree of warming in North America can reduce river flow by up to 10%. So when you start talking about three to four degrees, you realize we are literally constricting the water that sustains human settlements, not to mention the ecosystems that we rely on. Heat waves we all understand here in Australia, and we know because the ANU does such fantastic research, that the difference between experiencing a heat wave in a city with and without trees is 7%. And we've allowed our cities to become asphalt jungles. So the US Academy of Sciences suggests that the average heat wave in a four degree world will be 19 days long. We are creating an unlivable planet and our democracies are, aren't capable of helping us auto-correct this. So, it, you know, it's very challenging to come as the bearer of this news, which of course you all know, and the human consequences of the scenario we are actively walking into right now, we know will play out most intensely here in the Asia Pacific region, where mega deltas of the world will experience not just sea level rise, but storm surges that will force a mass migration of humanity. And when we design globalization, and you know, I'm originally a banker, I might sound like a climate kook, but I started my career at Morgan Stanley. I have a very you know, traditional Wall Street training. Um, it, it, it's, it's hard to imagine that we design this thing, globalization with global capital global technology, and we forgot that the people can't move across the borders, right? And then we created this hothouse. So that's where we're at. Now, of course, I'm here with a good news story. Really? Really, because my pride in being a non-executive director of Australian Ethical runs deep. I first came to Australia in 1990 and I was volunteering at the Wilderness Society as a young backpacker and ran into some people who were looking at this thing called the August Investment Trust, which was the precursor of what Australian Ethical had become. It's a bunch of people who said, we don't want to just stop the logging, we want to grow plantations, we want a, a trust to do that. And that was a very small thing that was getting sort of $50 million in investment and gradually it began to grow. And then lo and behold, by the mid 1990s, I found myself being the chief financial officer at Greenpeace. And we moved our superannuation into Australian Ethical and realized how many nonprofits had gone there. And it gradually, it listed on, 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 on the ASX and, you know, could access capital and people could buy shares and it continued to grow. And then when I joined the board um, of Australian Ethical in 2013, there were about 450 funds under management. Uh, two minutes remaining, I'll be very quick. Let me tell you, we now have $3.7 billion. We are Australia's fastest growing superannuation fund. And here is what we do, because I know a number of you are invested with us, and this is what your superannuation is doing. We actually track the SDG impact of the products and services produced by the companies that we invest in, and they are 3.4 times the benchmark. We engage on hard issues, animal rights issues, human rights issues, not just environmental issues. We take them to the boardrooms, we take them to government, we activate our very large social media following. The carbon footprint of our investments is 70% below the benchmark. We are tracking towards net zero and we decarbonize our portfolio very transparently. We do not invest in fossil fuel companies, oil, gas, coal. We're very deliberate about the developers, the financial institutions. We always, we have a charter that has guided rigorous ethical discretion over 30 years. We have private equity alongside CSIRO. We invest in renewables and innovation. If your super is with Australian Ethical, then um, you are the owner of Sundrop, 
which is that amazing farm in South Australia that produced fruit and veggies, all with circular economy, recycled water, recycled energy, and, and you can buy it at Coles and Woolies. So it's a marvelous model. And, you know, I gave a talk at um, Splendor in the Grass, which was amazing. Oh my God, I'll, I'll do it again tomorrow. I got a really bad cold, so be careful if you go to Splendor, because especially if you're a bit older, a lot of activity. But they actually, they booed me off the stage for saying the following, please do not boo me off the stage. Because we cannot rely on governments to do what needs to be done. We have to do it every which way. And that means we have to create enterprises just like Australian Ethical. We can do this. And here's the thing. When I joined the board, the share price was 21 cents. And yesterday, it was $2.60. That's a 12x. That's the kind of stuff we love in Silicon Valley. And it's not aggregating tremendous wealth for a handful of billionaires, no. It is a highly democratic model. So um, our foundation last year gave away $900,000 to charity. We are one of Australia's largest corporate donors. And in closing, I just thought I would read to you, we give away to people, to animals, and to the planet. And we have a big competition, and you know we're investing very strategically as well. And in the people, this is what your super did. So grants to Refugees Welcome Australia, the Community Grocer, the Love Mercy Foundation that provides women in northern Uganda with loans for seeds, Free to Shine, social workers supporting girls in Cambodia, Abundant Water in Timor-Leste, Hobart Women's Shelter. So how amazing, right? We can rely on each other, and we have to embrace this model that we have. It's called capitalism, but let's make it conscious. Thank you very much for what you do. Thank you, Mara, and thank you so much for stepping in then.